Hello, everyone. Welcome on the education and reproducibility session. My name is Marcin Kuczynski. I have a pleasure to be the host during this afternoon. We have a few interesting speakers and a lot of fascinating talks during this session. The first one will be given by Shella Rina, and it's going to be about instructional design for students with ADHD uh, to learn English. And I'm really looking forward to your thoughts, Shella, and uh, just enjoy and uh, good luck. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Shell Arena from Sampurna University, Jakarta, Indonesia. So I'd like to present you about my topic, an instructional design for students with ADHD to learn English. So actually this topic was my research to get my bachelor degree in Sampurna University with Maria Mercedes as my advisor. So I think uh, this is unusual for you and I will share a bit to you. So, okay. Uh, I'm, I will share about the background of the study, the purpose, the method, and the result. Okay, let's start. Okay. Basically, the presence of children with special needs require education, same as with the children without special needs, in order to meet their needs and to develop their maximum potential. However, special education services in inclusive schools are still inadequate compared to the number of children with special needs, especially in Indonesia. According to the Ministry of Indonesian Education 2017, there are 1.6 million children with special needs, but only 18% children receive inclusive education service. This is because the lack of socialization and training on inclusive education that makes the teachers who have special needs students in their classes face difficulty in dealing with such students. And those children with special needs actually who are having disabilities in mental, physical, emotional, and developmental such as autism, specific learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, emotional disturbance, and etc. Then, in the case of Jakarta, there are 26% of special needs students aged 6 to 13 years old are categorized as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. And teachers may face challenging to teach students with ADHD in the classroom because they cannot follow instruction, they lack of attention, cannot finish tasks on time, uh, sometimes interrupt people, and etc. So, as the purpose of my study, to make a project in order to pr propose instructional design to help teacher facilitates students with ADHD to learn English in inclusive classroom. Then to produce a unit plan and teaching materials that guide English teacher to implement the instruction and tools to assess students' performance. And this project focuses on English lesson because the student had difficulty to focus on the teacher's explanation Sometimes the students fail to accomplish writing assignment and answering questions due his lack of con concentration in English classroom. Then as the significance of this project for teachers, this project can be used as a guideline to involve students with ADHD in learn 
in learning process to create successful inclusive classroom. And for the ADAC students, this project can help them to overcome their learning problems and conditions. And as the method of this study, in conducting this project, I did need analysis through classroom observation and interview with the classroom teachers. So far, first I did observation class the classroom uh, about the students' behavior, the learning style, um, his or her advantages or disadvantages and how they react to the teacher's instruction or explanation. Then I did the interview with the classroom teachers about the student's achievement, um, their academic result, and how the teacher overcome the, the student's learning problems. So uh, this input as the core of my um, in creating the unit plan on a topic in English lesson. And in this case, I use um, the topic of describing animals. And then I, after I create the unit plan, I made the evaluation from the expert feedback. So this is the lesson plan, a brief, I will explain briefly. So this is the topic, describing animals and the objectives to increase students' vocabulary about animals, then to teach simple present tense in describing animals, then to develop students' understanding about descriptive, descriptive text in describing animal with use uh, correct grammar. And as the learning outcomes, the student is as expected to be able to describe an animal using proper vocabulary and correct grammar. Uh, so here, the activities and the detailed procedure as the instruction to ADHD students. Uh, as the opening, uh, the teacher can greet the students, uh, especially for the student with ADHD, instead of just, hello, how are you today? But the teacher can show the enthusiasm uh, in, with the, in greeting the students by uh, maybe using gesture like, how's your feeling today? Show me your thumbs up if you feel good to get study. And if you feel tired, you can show your thumbs down, something like that. Then uh, in the main activity, the teacher can call his name to get his attention because in this case, the, teach, the students, the ADAC students um, have lack of attention. And as the post activity, uh, this, the teacher can use worksheet. And then after the teacher explain to all students to do the task, the teacher needs to come to the students and giving one-on-one -on -one session or work one-on-one -on -one with the students in order to make sure the students understand better to do the task. Okay, this is the material. Uh, actually, the in this lesson, divided into three meetings, and this is the first meeting. Uh, the teacher can use video to teach grammar and vocabulary to the ADHD students. Um, video actually can be used for the teacher to attract the student's attention. Uh, and the students will understand better about the learning material. And next, the worksheet. Uh, there are several pictures here, uh, also to get the student's attention. And next in the second meeting is the reading activity. 
So in this case, I use uh, the story about Salsa the Elephant. Uh, this is the story. Uh, so we, uh, I used the simple sentence to make sure the students will understand with the text. Then after that, um, the students need to, after read the text, the students need to share uh, his or, or her opinion, what, what uh, they got from the text in this chart. This is to test their comprehension skills. Then this is the third meeting. So in this activity, the students asked to do a role play. And in this case, uh, they will play as a zookeeper. And the teacher will give the scenario. Um, and once again, when the teacher wants to give instruction, the teacher needs to call his name and um, tell to him directly in order to get his attention. And the teacher needs to explain clearly so he or she will understand better with the teacher's instruction. Okay. Um, in designing the lesson, the product, uh, I also make an, made an evaluation uh, using rubric and self-reflection. So first, the, this is the rubric. Uh, actually, the evaluation from the expert who teach English and who ha and have experience in teaching students with ADHD. So the, this expert as the evaluator because uh, she has experience in dealing with the students with ADHD and uh, she also will know better on evaluating the product, whether it's can, it can be applied to the students or not. And next, the self-reflection from the designer, which is from me. Um, the self-reflection refer refers to the criteria from the rubric uh, in order to make the result in line with the evaluation from the expert. From the uh, criteria in the rubric, I drew the self-reflection questions on the purpose of the instructional, such as did the product create it suitable for the students with ADHD? And did the goal can improve the student with ADHD performance? Then also I reflected on the objectives of the lesson, whether it can be achieved by the student with ADHD and can be aligned with the curriculum used by school. In this case, the curriculum used by the school is national curriculum in Indonesia. And the result, so here is the result. The expert, the evaluator named Tita Helini from Class Pinta. Uh, as the result, the product is applicable for the student with ADHD. Can and can improve his performance because there are few activities that can build his performance, like um, worksheet, video, watching video, um, do a role play. And then the content used is appropriate for the students, students with ADHD, because it contains attractive media to approach the students' participation in learning. However, the expert also stated that it would be better if the designer used more pictures or illustration to visualize the text on the reading activity because the student with ADHD is visual learner. Um, if I can go back here, the reading activity. Yeah, so here is only text. So the expert uh, suggests suggested to add more illustration.
So, um, in conclusion, so conclusion, uh, actually every student with special needs shows different symptoms and having different needs. Uh, it can be concluded that one instructional design cannot be applied to a student despite of his or her similarities of needs. Therefore, this designs to be updated regularly based on the needs of the students. That's all from me. If you have any questions, you can chat on the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Shaw. Really interesting study. Really good job. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Now we will go to the second speaker, who is Faris Naji. Uh, and we'll speak about liberating the, uh, the programmer and empowering the non-programmer. So really curious what you have, <laughs> yeah. have for today and good luck. Well, thank you. So my name is Faris. I'm a co-founder of Tursen and uh, I've been working in the, uh, with OR for 20 years. So I've been in the biotech uh, world using OR, especially the bioconductor packages. So I love OR and thanks very much for for inviting me here for the 15 minutes and organizing this. I think OR should be promoted and it's good to see these initiatives. So I've been dealing for the last 20 years with two types of people, coders and non-coders. So um, of course I'm a coder myself, so um, I relate to coders, but uh, the biologists that I was working with uh, were non-coders. And the biologists, these are usually sometimes medical doctors, oncologists, clinicians, so there's a lot of non-coders compared to coders. Some of the non-coders end up trying to learn coding, which happens to be successful maybe 10%, 20% of the time. I've tried to convert many non-coders to be a coder. And um, um, that has always ended up kind of partially successful, but overall 80% of the people wouldn't have finished my workshop for coding. So I knew something uh, needs to be done between these two communities. And I came, uh, the objective of my presentation is to show you how you can uh, basically get non-coders to be using more OR packages and more OR um, algorithms. So that's the objective. And I want to show how we liberate basically the coder as well and how we empower the non-coder. So I'll start. So when a coder produces a OR package, it's already quite a lot of work to make the OR package, but it's pretty cool and it's pretty useful. Um, and now the question is, how do you bring this OR package to the non-coding world? Uh, sometimes the package is not meant for non-coders and it's only meant for coders, so that's okay, but majority of the domain experts are non-coders. So you end up with package management issues, and I think there's a talk talking about that with ORMV. You end up with data management issues for like data wrangling, making sure that the data can be uploaded and manipulated, stored. You, you deal with deployment issues, uh, maintenance issues, and how to maintain the OR package, but also maintain the communication with the non-coder and how to use it, how to train the non-coder, how to support the non-coder, how to supervise the non-coder and the workshops that you would do to try and get the non-coder to use your R package. So this is a typical scenario. I've gone through this uh, myself and it's quite, uh, uh, making the package is fun. Um, and the last 20%, which takes 80% of your work or time is actually trying to get it being used uh, and um, available to be quickly used by non-coders. So in the end, uh, liberation is all about trying to get them, the coder just to focus on making packages and in innovating and supervising methodologies and education and with zero in the, in deployment. So you want the coder to basically uh, code the kernel of the package and you want the non-coder wants to be able to get control of the data, add meta information. I, know, I noticed this a lot with biology. They always want to add meta annotations. So the OR package is one layer, but they want to put extra layers on top. 
They want to visualize more, they want to explore, especially with exploratory, exploratory data analysis, and they want to handle large sizes. I say um, they want to be empowered. So it, maybe people are not aware, but the machines in the labs are starting to produce quite a lot of data before the run used to uh, taking the design of the experiment would take a while, uh, but the run would take the most of the time and the analysis would be some part afterwards. But now in the current situation, and it's been a revolution in the last 20 years, the designing is a little bit more complex. The running happens over one or two days or sometimes an hour. And it produce, and you spend you spend more time in analysis. So the domain experts, like the biologists, um, end up doing more analysis than they would normally have done. And uh, to to make things a little bit worse is that the, usually there is only one coder in the lab, and a lot of biologists who don't code. And this ratio is pretty. I've seen ratios of one to fourteen. One to I've I've actually been in one department. It was one to thirty. So there is a bottleneck here, and there is a problem. And we need to get harmony between these two, because at the moment it's not harmonious. Uh, well, sometimes it is harmonious and it does work very well, and that's fantastic. But in a lot of cases, there's just not enough coders. Um, so we want, and that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, I started Tercent to solve this problem. Um, a lot of people are using, especially the non-coders, they're using Prism and Excel, and the coders are using SAS, Python, and Bioconductor. In the y-axis here, I have this coding skills that are necessary. On the x-axis, I have whether you know, whether it's small data or large data. And you can see Prism and um, Excel are up here on the top left. That's because they have very, um, that you don't need so much coding and you can do quite a lot. You can do quite a lot down here with bigger data, with Python and SAS and Bioconductor. And I try to hit this spot here and capitalize on the OR community um, because um, I'll show you this, how I did this. But I basically wanted to put a layer on top of OR that um, non-coders could use. Um, compared to Tableau and Spotfire, which, which would be my closest equivalent, um, they're not as flexible as Tercent, and you'll see now as I do the demo. So I want to show some use cases where I have managed to change things. Um, one thing is the large Excel. This is where the bioinformatician or the coder has produced, uh, using the pipeline, has produced a large Excel. Um, and I'm going to show you how, to, how that was uh, manipulated by the non-coder. Um, I'm going to show you about a, a Shiny app where I show you how a coder uh, made a shiny app and then deployed it, and then the non-coder could use it in a much more flexible way. And I'm going to show you meta annotation, how to add meta annotation. Um, in, uh, for example, while you're wanting to use the shiny app, the biologist may want to add some uh, meta annotation. So I'm going to show you the files that I'm going to deal with. So this is my desktop. Um, basically, I show you what a bioinformatician supplies a non-coder. So this is a typical type of data from the bioinformatics world. You basically have a column of genes and you have all these columns here called um, basically samples. So what you um, basically, this, this Excel is given by email or sent by email by the bioinformatician to the, to the actual uh, non-coder. And this is what I suggest they do. They use, I'm clicking now to go to Tercent. So this is the Tercent um, platform. You can see here, it looks very much like GitHub. I took a lot of the ideas or inspired by GitHub and I'm trying to make a GitHub for biologists basically. And uh, here you can create a new project. For example, um, um, I call this the online demo project. And when you create a project, you can start uploading your data. So you click on new data you select the data, which is the Excel that I just showed you. For example, um, let me just minimize this, yes. So you select the Y data here um, and you open it. You say, okay, you say next. Here you see your Excel that you're gonna upload, but you have an advanced tab here where you're allowed to do this uh, gathering, which is something that in OR you do quite a lot, but uh, non-coders don't do it. And here they can start gathering. What am I gathering here? I'm basically gathering all the columns except the gene ID that I showed you. And these columns represent the samples. So I'll give them a sample name and I'll give the values measurement name. And 
So now I have uploaded the data and I've managed to do a gathering. Then you can start a new workflow by clicking here and say analysis. So this is what the non-coder would do with the data that was being produced by the coder. And they can they open up and you get a canvas, a completely white canvas. And you can add onto the canvas and start adding data, which is called a table, which is the table I just uploaded. So you can see here, I have added the table. Now I can add a data step afterwards and it automatically opens up this uh, data step. Here is uh, where most of the concepts of Tursen um, and why I call it a kind of GUI layer to OR. Because you can, here you see, these are the uh, columns that I have now, the measurement and the sample. This is after the gather step when you import it. And I can put measurement anywhere. I can put it as a filter, as a color, as an error bar, as a y-axis or a row or an x-axis or a column. Here I'm going to put it as a y-axis. And I can take sample and I can put it up um, um, as a, in all of those green areas that light up here, but I'll put it as a column concept because that makes, that's the way the Excel was as well. And I'll put the gene ID as a um, row concept because that was also the kind of projection that the genomics guys, um, non-coders or the domain, people from that domain do. And you see, it's like the Excel. I've just basically visualized the Excel and with the measurement, you can now color with the actual heat map. And in this heat map here, you see, so you can start making projections and there are a couple of projections you can make. Um, I can go back to this and I can rename uh, the, the data step and say, this is a heat map projection of this uh, file, this large file. And I can duplicate it and say, well, I'm gonna do some computation on it. I'm going to do a, a simple mean to, to, as an illustrative uh, test as an illustrative step. And here I'm going to remove the sample. I'm going to stop the coloring and I'm going to go into point mode. And in point mode here, uh, and because I removed the sample factor, which was um, was in my original Excel after the gather step, um, it's, it's, it's got rid of the grouping. It's like a, removing a group by, and now you have a group by just by genes. When I say group by for people who code, they know what I mean from the tidyverse uh, vocabulary. So now you have a gene, basically all the values for the genes for all the samples here. And now I can add a mean step, for example. Here's a mean step. And the mean step um, is an OR operator. And I can click here to show you what it does, but I'll first run it. Well, I'll actually click here and I'll show it to you immediately. It goes to GitHub. All our operators are on GitHub. And um, basically you see here is the code. This is the mean operator for us. It's basically a group by, and then you call the mean operator and you save it. And that's what is being executed here. When I do this um, mean, I run it. I, it causes the mean to execute. And I add a step afterwards, a data step. And this is the beauty of Tursen is that you can, um, once you've calculated something like the mean, you still have the original factors, but now you have this extra thing here on the left called the mean, and it's made the projection with the mean. So you can, for example, do a heat map on the mean. For example, you just calculated the mean. This is the mean. You can take the mean and you can use it as a factor to change the view. Let's say I want to order by the mean. So here's I'm ordering the mean of every gene, for example, uh, across all samples. And you can see it orders it uh, perfectly. Um, and this allows you to basically keep adding a workflow um, and keep adding um, steps and operators. But let's say, for example, that in my heat map, or let's say you have a shiny app and I'm going to add a shiny operator at the moment. Let's say the uh, bioinformatician has made a shiny operator. Uh, I'm going to take one now. I look at the, on our GitHub, look for the shiny one. I'll take the, the shiny heat map, uh, which is down here, shiny heat map. So I'm going to install this operator from GitHub into Tursen. And I look at this uh, shiny operator and I look at the tags, it's 0, 1, 16. So I go back to the, um, to the Y or uh, team area. I go to the libraries, I add from Git the actual, uh, I think it's 0 0.16 I said. Um, this is not important. 
so I've installed it, the Shiny heat map. And I can go back to my um, protocol that I was working on here. And I can add to the, sh the heat map we made. I can personalize and I can click here and add the Shiny heat map. This is a, and immediately you see on the left, left here, a um, tab appearing. I click on the tab and you can see that the, sh the Shiny is actually running on the projection. So this projection here is the data and here is what the Shiny is actually executing. It's using the data from the projection. So um, your, your, and the, the, the beauty of this is that uh, for a, um, a non-programmer, programmer, they can go back here and they can remove, for example, genes and samples. Um, if they wanted to, they can like only keep this one, keep only a subsection of the, the data. This is a filtering step, like we call it in the tidyverse. So the non-coder can do filtering, can do uh, ordering, can do uh, basically um, everything a programmer can do. Not everything, but most things for manipulating the data. And then the shiny here will only get the subselection that has been uh, selected by the non-programmer. This means that the programmer, the OR programmer, is liberated from all the data management issues um, that can be associated with making a Shiny. So we, we basically have a, a cloud version that you just saw. You can download the dev version in Studio. It's called Tercent Studio. It's an OR Studio with a Tercent OR package. Uh, we have an enterprise as well. And um, I've gone through all these um, basically cases. I didn't show you the metadata. I'm a bit limited for time, but you can also do a join step like I showed you, or like I showed how you added a, um, a data step. There's a thing called a join step. And we, we think that Tercent, hopefully you now I'm convinced you that I can liberate, you can liberate yourself from a lot of the details when you write or code, you will deploy it to Tercent and the user will be able to the non-coder will be able to do quite a lot with your with your OR package or your Shiny. Um, I'm looking for OR coders and use cases, so please contact me by uh, Slack about if you want to uh, um, work with me or work on a use case. I'm looking for OR coders. Uh, excuse me for the lousy photoshopping here. That's supposed to be me. And uh, it's free, so you can go to Tercent and sign up. Um, and you can look at the GitHub that we have. It, you can see all the code uh, and how our operators are working. So thanks very much. This is Faris. Uh, you can ask uh, um, questions on Slack or contact me by email here. So I'm going to stop my sharing. OK. Hey, thanks, Faris. That was really fascinating talk. There were some comments regarding your presentation on uh, YouTube chat, so you can follow up there. And now we will uh, follow up with Indra Neil. Uh, if you could share the screen and turn your video on. Yeah. Indra Neil will talk about teaching quantum computing and game theory with QGame Theory package. So um, yeah, share the screen and let's, let's get the show started. Uh, is it visible, Marcel? Yes, I can. I can see it. Oh, thanks. Hello, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, teaching quantum computing and game theory uh, with QGame theory package. So I'm a master student in physics from Jadavpur University, and also the research lead in uh, CP Products and Services Private Limited. So uh, my talk will cover uh, a toolbox, QGAM theory package, uh, and which can be used to study and practice the basic concepts of quantum computing and quantum game theory with the R language. So uh, one can use it to design some uh, simple quantum circuits and also uh, use those functionalities that simulate uh, several quantum game theory models. Uh, this presentation will start with some uh, basic introductions to uh, quantum gates and quantum circuits, and uh, also we'll move towards uh, discussing some uh, classical ga game theory uh, concepts. Uh, and at the last, uh, we'll talk about uh, some uh, quantum game theoretic models called uh, quantum prisoner's dilemma, uh, quantum penny flip ga game, and uh, some more if time permits. So. Uh, you can actually, uh, so our my package is actually uh, in CRAN. So you can also uh, download this from GitHub or uh, from CAN. 
So, so uh, diving into quantum computation, uh, what are qubits and qubits? Uh, so qubits uh, and qubits are the basic units of quantum computation. A uh, qubit is a two-level system, and a qubit is a three-level system. So inside the package, uh, a quantum environment called Q has been designed uh, so for that makes our uh, coding uh, a bit easier. So uh, the, uh, this uh, package has access to a maximum of six qubits uh, for now. Uh, so uh, I actually plan to increase the number of qubits later in the future uh, to make more uh, to include more simulations and uh, computations. So uh, qubit uh, zero, like K, denoted by K zero, is actually the um, I mean the vector uh, denoted by one zero, and qubit one is uh, the vector two cross one uh, column vector denoted by uh, zero and one, and that can be represented in the package using q dollar q naught and q dollar q one. Similarly, q treat uh, zero one and two, uh, which are uh, denoted by uh, column vectors one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one, can be represented similarly uh, with the package uh, writing q dollar q t zero q t one and q t two respectively. Uh, so a simple uh, quantum uh, state called k zero one zero, for example, can be represented uh, also like uh, writing this way q dollar q zero one zero, and it will uh, give the um, I mean the vector representation. So we can also generate some uh, arbitrary quantum systems. Uh, for example, k uh, shy equals to k zero. Uh, Kronecker product one by root two k zero plus one by root two k one, and that can be similarly written uh, with the um, Q game theory package like this. So psi equals to Kronecker. Uh, this is a uh, R function Kronecker uh, in bracket Q dollar Q naught comma Q dollar Q naught by square root two plus Q dollar Q one by square root two. As simple as that. So if we uh, Run psi uh, in the uh, R studio. So let's suppose in the R studio console, uh, we will see that we'll get the uh, vector. Uh, representation the column representation so now we can also perform uh, measurements on uh, on this final uh, quantum states uh, by using this q uh, measure uh, function um, from the q game theory package so q measure shy will uh, give us this probability distribution plot so here we see that uh, the quantum state 0 0 and 0 1 uh, appear with equal probability of 0 0.5 so both of them have the equal probability uh, now also, we can uh, we have uh, access to uh, a large number of quantum logic gates uh, using this Q game theory package, and these are the unitary matrices. So uh, the the most simplest uh, one is the identity matrix. So I equals to uh, one zero zero one, and that can be represented by Q dollar I two. And uh, another uh, important uh, gate is the poly X gate, uh, which is also called the qubit flipping operator. So denoted by sigma x equals to zero one one zero, and that can also be written as sigma x. Uh, q dollar i2 with the uh, q game theory package so uh, like applying sigma x on qubit 0 will give qubit 1 so uh, this can also be uh, like verified uh, using the q game theory package so we can also define uh, poly y matrix and poly z matrix similarly uh, and uh, another very important gate called the hadamard gate uh, h equals to 1 by root 2 1 1 1 minus 1 uh, can be uh, written uh, with the q game theory package Similarly, uh, these are some complex uh, gates called the C0 uh, gate. Uh, so this is a four cross four uh, matrix. Uh, similarly represented uh, writing C0 Q dollar I4. So I4 is actually uh, the chronicle product of two I2s. Uh, so that has already been uh, implemented in, in Q game theory. Uh, applying C0 gate now on the quantum state uh, gate 1, 1 will give this uh, vector representation. Uh, also, we can uh, define this Fredkin gate, which is an uh, eight cross eight uh, matrix. So there are also uh, other uh, logic gates, two system logic gates like T gate, phase gate, topoly gate, and rational gates, Rx, Ry, and Rz. Uh, also, uh, for three system logic gates, we can define the Gelman matrix uh, with the Q game theory uh, package. Now, uh, the Bell states are. Uh, some important concepts in uh, quantum computing. So the Bell states are the quantum states of two qubit systems. So uh, that represent the simplest and the maximal uh, examples of quantum entanglements. So they are the set of normalized basis vectors. So these Bell states are extensively used in analysis of two applications uh, called super dense coding and quantum teleportation. So you uh, might have heard about these uh, terms in quantum computing. Uh, so these are very trending terms nowadays. So uh, there are uh, four possible Bell states. So th th those can also be simulated using the Q game theory package with this simple uh, function. So Bell uh, Q dollar Q naught comma Q dollar Q one. This is one of the um, uh, Bell states. 
also you can define the other one. So BL Q dollar Q1 comma Q dollar Q1. And also the other two combinations can also be defined. We can also do quantum Fourier transform with this uh, QGM theory package. Uh, so now uh, a simple quantum algorithm uh, represented by the circuit model uh, starts by initializing a constant state and then performing unitary gate operations on the circuit. So after that, we finally measured the um, quantum state. So we see that I have generated this circuit using the uh, IBM Q experience. Uh, uh, so now we see that the initial state is uh, quantum state k zero zero. Uh, we apply two Hadamard gates uh, each uh, uh, at all both the two wires, followed by application of X at the first wire and uh, identity gate at the second wire. Then we finally measure. So this can also uh, uh, the, the code has been written like this uh, with the Q game theory package. So psi equals to Q dollar Q uh, zero zero, which represents the k uh, zero zero quantum state. Then I have defined Hadamard and uh, sigma X. So X is actually the um, sigma X uh, polygate. So uh, then we define HH and XI. So this is the uh, intermediate uh, quantum uh, state, uh, which has been generated by applying HH uh, on uh, Psi. So this is the um, percentage, uh, star percentage is actually the dot product uh, in R. So uh, then we uh, get the uh, final uh, quantum state applying uh, XI on the intermediate quantum state, and then we measure. So after measurement, we see that uh, we'll get this probability distribution plot. Now, where all the uh, quant possible quantum, quantum states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 have equal probability of appearing, uh, that is 0 0.25. Now, uh, in uh, moving into uh, classical game theory uh, concepts, so uh, there are two uh, algorithms called the IDSDS algorithm and Nash equilibrium algorithm to find the uh, to find the solution of a uh, particular uh, game that we are considering. So uh, those two can also be uh, done with this Q game theory package. So Simply the P1 and P2 are the, um, I mean, the payoff matrices for each of the players involved in a two person game. Then we uh, write this IDSDS uh, function and then pass P1 and P2 as arguments. And then we find out the cell, which is actually the equi equilibrium for that uh, particular matrix and also the values. Here uh, we see that for these arbitrary matrices, we get four and three. Similarly, for the Nash equilibrium, to find out the Nash equilibrium, we write Nash P1, P2, and we'll get the um, cell results. So what is a quantum game theory now? Quantum classical game theory when analyzed from the perspective of uh, quantum uh, computation and quantum probability amplitudes is uh, called quantum game theory. Uh, this pro provides us with extra uh, abilities to utilize the entanglement, which is a quantum uh, phenomenon uh, between players' moves and also the linear superpositions of strategy actions that are uh, the strategies that are played by the players. The players perform uh, local unitary operations on uh, their qubits that is analogous to the classical moves they play in classical game theory. Now, uh, for dynamic games like quantum penny flip, uh, the property of superposition between qubits may be sufficient for analysis. But for static games like uh, quantum prisoner's dilemma that we'll see uh, later, generally qu we require quantum entanglement. So these two, uh, like quantum entanglement and uh, quantum su uh, this superposition, these are the two important concepts of uh, quantum computation. Now, uh, to jump into a uh, penny flip game. So this game is played between two players. Let us assume them to be Alice and Bob. Here, Alice plays first, uh, followed by Bob. So the rules of the games are jotted down. Uh, so out of the two equally probable states of an unbiased penny, that is head and tail, uh, head and tail, Alice sets the initial state of the penny in either head or tail. Now, both of them have access to, both Alice and uh, Bob has uh, access to two possible strategies called S1 and S2, that, uh, that is either flip the penny or uh, keep the penny as it is. So after Alice's initial setting of the uh, state, Bob, uh, without knowing what Alice has played, plays either S1 or S2. So uh, for uh, now we'll consider that Alice, uh, we will expect Alice to play, uh, I mean, uh, set the state of the penny to be in head. Otherwise, if she uh, sets the penny to be in tail state, that we'll consider that to be a cheating in her part. So this is just for, uh, our, for our analysis. So after this, again, Alice, uh, after Bob has played, Alice will play uh, either S1 or S S2. And at last, again, Bob will play uh, S1 or S2 without uh, knowing what Alice has played. Now the final state is checked. If the final state is in head state, uh, Alice loses one point and Bob gains one point. Otherwise, if it, in, if it is in uh, tail state, the reverse happens. So this is a two-player zero-sum game where the payoffs actually add to give zero. So they are opposite to each other. Uh, now the quantum version of the game is discussed. So uh, the head and tail states are replaced by the up and down states. That is up is actually the um, qubit zero, uh, which is uh, the column vector one zero. And down state is uh, the qubit one, which is the column vector zero one. 
the strategies are replaced by uh, now the strategies are replaced by unitary operations s1 is replaced by sigma x that is the spin flip operator and s2 is replaced by the identity gate that is the identity operator uh, the initial quantum state is said to be either up or down the rules for the sequence of the uh, player moves remain the same as it is uh, for the classical version then we finally measure the uh, quantum state and, and uh, the game is analyzed so this is one of the instances. Uh, uh, so inst we, as I said before, that uh, we expect Alice to be uh, set, set the, um, I mean, uh, we expect her to set the uh, penny to be in up state, but uh, she cheats and uh, sets the uh, penny to be in down state. So this is an instance where both Alice and Bob will cheat, and then we'll uh, analyze the final, state, final result. So Bob, instead of playing uh, Sigma X or I, uh, he plays a, um, he plays the Hadamard game. So, uh, it changes the d state to be uh, in u minus d by root two. Then, if Alice plus sigma x, uh, it will change to d minus u by root two. And if Alice plus uh, i, it will change. It will remain the same. Then again, finally, Bob plus h, and accordingly, the final states are uh, the final outcomes are produced. So this is the um, simulation. Similarly, we can do that. Uh, this is a very easy code. And if we see the probability distribution plot after measurement, we'll see that both of, uh, I mean, both the qubit zero and one have equal probability of, uh, I mean, appearing after measurement. So uh, that means that both Alice and Bob will have the equal probability of winning. No one has advantage over the other one. So if both of them cheats this way, both will have the equal probability of winning. That's the final analysis. Now we move to uh, prisoner's dilemma. So prisoner's dilemma is a paradoxical situation occurring in uh, game theory or decision analysis problems, which shows two rational agents might not cooperate with each other, even though it appears that it is in their best interest to do so. So uh, it is a two plus two non-zero sum game, uh, unlike the first one, uh, where the payoffs doesn't add up to be uh, zero. Generally presented, this is a static game. Uh, so the game reads in the following way. Uh, there are two suspects, Alice and Bob, suspected of committing a crime together, who has been brought in for interrogation. So both of them have uh, has access to uh, two strategy moves, either to uh, cooperate represented by C or to defect represented by D. In the quantum version, uh, the cooperation will be uh, kept as uh, I, I mean the identity of operation, and defect will be replaced by sigma x. None of them knows what the other one does. So both the rational players uh, try to maximize their expected utility uh, with mixed strategy. So rationality comes into play here. So we introduce four payoffs. So W, X, Y, Z are the payoffs where Z is uh, where they follow this chain of inequalities. Z is greater than W is greater than X, which is greater than Y. So uh, this is the uh, payoff matrix. So if we look uh, here carefully, we'll see that uh, we saw that X is uh, actually uh, less than W. But if we uh, apply IDSDS algorithm or Nash equilibrium, we'll see that uh, the equilibrium of the game comes to be in defect uh, state. So both of them defecting. So, but uh, if both of them had cooperated with each other, each other they would have, um, I mean, ended up with uh, results W and W. But as W is greater than X, so instead of defecting, if they, they would have uh, cooperated with each other, each other, they would have ended up with a better result. But that doesn't happen. Rationality, uh, I mean, forces them to play, I mean, defect, uh, both, forces both of them to defect. And that is the paradox here. So using quantum uh, game th quantum uh, game theory, we can actually uh, I mean escape from this uh, dilemma, and we can uh, come up with results where uh, this uh, payoff values would be greater than x and x. So that can also be uh, simulated with uh, this Q game theory package. So I will uh, skip this uh, theoretical portions. Uh, so here, one instance of the uh, quantum prisoner's dilemma game can be simulated first by providing the strategies played by both Alice and Bob, along with the payoffs W X Y Z. So here QPD is the uh, function. Uh, we pass uh, these strategies. Uh, the first one is the strategy of Alice. Uh, here we see uh, she has played Hadamard gate. And the second one is the strategy of uh, Bob. Uh, here he has played uh, Sigma Z. And this, these are W, X, Y, Z values, 3, 1, 0, 5. And we'll see that we'll end up with uh, uh, pair of values, 1.5 and 4.0. 4 so this is the uh, probability distribution plot for this particular result, for this, per, for this single uh, result. So we, if we pass all the four possible uh, moves, uh, we can actually end up with the four, cro four cross four uh, matrices bo for both Alice and Bob, uh, representing their payoffs, and all uh, with all the 16 values. And also, all the 16 probability uh, distribution plots can be uh, found out. So then, if we apply IDSDS algorithm and Nash equilibrium, we'll see that uh, their um, payoffs have actually increased from uh, the previous uh, classical uh, value. So we can also play uh, quantum two-person duels. Uh, we can play quantum Hawk and Dove game. 
uh, there are like other three uh, games possible quantum battle of the sexes uh, quantum newcomb paradox and quantum monty hall problem so there are like uh, seven possible uh, games uh, quantum game theory games that have been implemented in uh, q game theory package so i'll be increasing more uh, i'll be including more uh, models in the future so that's it uh, these are the references and that's it that ends my talk thank you Thank you, Indraniel. That was a lot of advanced content, more than 30 slides for 15 minutes. So yeah, probably we will need to watch it a couple of thank times. You. Thank you for your input and for the time that you invested in the presentation. If you could stop sharing the screen, we could move to the next speaker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the next speaker is Veronika Puchała. Uh, Veronica starts the reproducibility part of our panel and she will present data science project management in R with obstacles and how to deal with them. Uh, Veronica, the floor is yours and good luck. Okay, so uh, have I managed to share my full screen with you? Yes, you managed. Okay, that's great, thanks. Okay, so uh, hello everybody and welcome to my talk. I've learned a few things the very hard way during our uh, recent project, and I'd like to share some kind of experience with you. So let's start with a little uh, info about me. Uh, my name is Veronika Puchała, and currently I'm working on my PhD in biophysics in Institute of Biochemistry and Biophysics Polish Academy of Sciences here in Warsaw. I work in a mass spectrometry lab, and that means that I'm working with biologists on experimental data. Also, after I graduated, I spent a couple of years working commercially. So I'd like to start with a disclaimer. So uh, when uh, those old tools that I'll be talking about are applicable. When you have a small team or maybe a test project, uh, when you work in a big company with uh, teams dedicated for things like testing or technical writing, it may not be uh, so useful because you should already know all these things. Uh, but you can still use it for your personal use. And also, I'll be talking about things that can be obvious. But I think that well-known things sometimes are the hardest to implement, and we should repeat talking about them over and over and over again. And I'm pretty sure I even uh, repeat myself during this short talk. So our project was the Shiny app for analyzing data from experiments from loaded file and the package to contain all of those functionalities. And about our academia reality, we don't have much money and much people. So we have to do our best with the tools we have. And sometimes we have to be really creative about them. OK, so what happened in our project? It was supposed to be a short three months long. And now it's almost two years later. And <laughs> we are still not where we wanted to be. But uh, when we started, we were not aware how broad the subject is. And actually, we were learning it during the project. And because we wanted our tool to be used for more than uh, three people, and our lab turns out to be very highly specialized, we were lacking some kind of general knowledge to make this tool useful for more people. And also, there is no official methodology and terminology in this field. And we were uh, confronted with this during our process of peer review, because our reviewers were from different labs, from different countries, and they were talking about the same things we were, but using different languages. The, well, the language was English, but different terms for different things. And this was really problematic. Also, they wanted a lot of things, a lot of features from us, and this was under time pressure. So where were we? We had a messy code that was hard to work on. We had outdated documentation and outdated package because all of the logic was in application because it, this was the easiest thing to do. Well, we were obviously not satisfied with this kind of situation, but could it be, could it be avoided? Uh, truth be told, I don't think so because we couldn't predict the unpredictable things like the assumptions changed or the new knowledge. So sometimes it just happens that you have a very good, um, good intentions, but still you can succeed because of things that change. So keep this in mind. Okay, so how to react when you realize that you are in this situation? 
So let's start with don't panic rule and the rule is don't panic because this happens and what you have to do is just take a deep breath and take a step back and plan what to do. You have to commit your time and attention to solving this kind of problem and you have to do it for the future you. Actually, you should be thinking about the future you a lot. And if you do it properly, uh, you won't have to do it again or at least anytime soon. So how to plan the process? Uh, personally, I think you should start with the things that will make this work more comfortable for you. Uh, so, and then gradually add uh, different things and start from the very important and very useful and the features should be in the end. Also, you should make the code independent from the author. I think this should be a standard in the community, but still it's not. But I think we should do our best to, to do it. And about time estimation, you should just multiply it by two because you know the unpredictable things can happen. For example, you have a colleagues that are not working and suddenly you are weeks behind your schedule. This is really stressful. So, uh, so just multiply the time. Okay, and before you start working on your code, you should test everything because you don't want to be in a situation when after your really hard work, well, you have different numbers because then you have to ask yourself a question. Are my numbers right now or they used to be? Well, this is a very bad dilemma. Uh, about unique testing, uh, there's a lot of great packages in R. So the, the well-known, I think, is test that. And it works really nice with Checkmate that provides you additional functions uh, to help you write unit tests. It also contains a lot of argument checks for your functions. And personally, I think that all the management of the parameters and the data that you, prov that you put in your functions should be in the functions in the package. Because later on, if you have, for example, shiny package like, like we did, you can just take this internal error message and show it to the user for validate. And this saves you a lot of, a lot of code in your server function. Also, there's Foudifer, a package for testing the plots. It basically makes a snapshot of your plot and then compares it with the different versions and different call, uh, call functions. Also, there's Shiny Tester for testing the Shiny application. And there's also, uh, this is not a package, but in repo called extra checks, uh, there are additional checks that Cron is doing. So this can also help you in this process of putting your package on Cron. Okay, and this is really, really important thing and often neglected also by me, to be honest. So documenting everything and everywhere and keeping it up to date. Just think about future you and other people that want to work on your project. In R, there are uh, pa great packages that Troxygen 2 and Package Down, and uh, they are building a very nice and easy to use uh, documentation without much additional effort. So you just have to write it, uh, write the documentation, then just have a couple of lines of code, and then you have a really nice and easy to use documentation. If you don't want to do it, you also have a, a Wikipedia page on your GitHub, you, if you have money, you can use Confluence, or if you don't want to use anything of that, just put it in readme, but put it somewhere. So uh, keep in mind that uh, writing the documentation is a process. So you may, be, you may be wondering when I finished with my documentation. So maybe when you print it, put it on a pile and it's bigger, for, it's bigger than you. Well, obviously I'm joking because it never stops. Okay, so you know what you want to do, you know the steps, and now you have to manage the project. Sometimes I even make a diary with comments like I only fixed half of the stuff and the application is not working, but this is very extra. So of course you can use Jira if you have the money. Uh, and, but we are using GitHub projects. And this is really nice and also helps you with uh, connecting the issues with commits. So you can easily see what was done by whom and when. Also, it doesn't provide this kind of complexity that, the, that Jira does. But hey, do you want your project to be complicated or done? So anything that works for you is fine. Uh, and this is really nice topic in our community because uh, dependencies. I know it's really nice that there is this ecosystem and you have so many great packages for great things. But if you are loading a package 
and you are using only one function from it, maybe you should think about it once more. Because all the packages have their own dependencies and it, it, sometimes it's a really long chain that we are not aware of. And the changes of one element of this chain can be very problematic for you. For example, like the recent change of Dplyr. It break my code. <laughs> but you know, uh, Dplyr is a really big and well-known package. So they make an announcement that they are doing it. And this may not be the case for small packages. So you update it and suddenly nothing is working. So just keep this in mind. And also there are a lot of packages that are actually wrappers for other packages. So, well, why use them? And to track the package versions of your of the packages is uh, strength. It's really nice to use, but you have to keep remember to do, doing snapshots of the versions. And well, if you don't want to use it, you can always use Anaconda with R if you have a reason to do so. And another different thing, and this was actually a first step in my project, was making the code under, um, understandable. So here you can see, well, this really ugly variable names that we were working on and we were adding them in time pressure and drawing the change assumptions. I'm not really proud of them, but don't judge me. I was not really aware what I was calculating back then, but I made a kind of glossary. So it's easier for the users of my package to know what the package is, uh, what the function is returning. This is really nice and useful when you can see the definitions of it bigger and as a summary. Also very important thing is descriptive names for, uh, and code, code conventions. For example, when you start uh, your function name from plot, you know it returns a ggplot2 object. This is really useful and helpful and makes your work with the code quite convenient. And oh, and of course you should document everything. And this is, uh, this is uh, really important when you are working with shiny applications like we did. So putting all of the logic into the package. In your uh, server function, there should be only callings of the functions, managing the inputs and outputs, and uh, managing the files from the user and something like that. So put everything in the package. And if you have repeated code or elements of Shiny application, just consider putting them as a module. In my, in my team, we are working a lot with Shiny applications. So recently we've decided to create another package that is, uh, that is also maintained by us and put there all the custom solutions for Shiny we are using. So, okay, we have an extra dependency, but this is a dependency I take care of. And we also save a lot of, uh, a lot of space in our server function and ma this makes it more easy to read and work on, of course. So here is a quick reminder to document everything and everywhere in case you've already forgotten. And my take home message is that you have to think ahead uh, as soon as possible and think what would future you want you to do right now. Then take a step back if you are in a, this really bad situation, think what you, what you have to do, identify your weakest links and use the existing tools or build your own. But remember that there is no one magic tool to help you and do everything for you. In the end, the weight of uh, cleaning up your project is on your shoulders. So don't be too hard on yourself because those things just happen sometimes. So thank you for your attention and I would like to acknowledge my team here. Thanks. Wow, Veronica, great stuff. I really appreciate the take home messages about uh, reproducibility and the documentation of your code. Uh, our next speaker is Jakub uh, Kawal, uh, who will speak about there it is. reproducibility. Yeah. Rel oh. and reproducible data yeah. science projects in R. Go for it. OK. Uh, you can hear me. The question is if you can see my screen. Yes, I can. OK. Uh, OK. Hello, everyone. Once more. Uh, my name is Jakub Kawa. I'm a Master of Data Science student at Warsaw University of Technology. And it's my great pleasure to give you a short lecture about two tools in R that can increase reproducibility of your projects. It's Rand and Drake. Okay, so the fact you are here means you already understand the need for reproducibility in our projects, both in academia and industry. So without any further introduction, we'll move on to the first tool, which is the Renf. 
it is project environment maintenance tool uh, in R. You probably already know if you use Python, you know visual environment, but there are plenty of different uh, tools. Okay, Rent makes your project firstly isolated, which means installing or updating packages in one R project will not affect other. Rent makes your R project also portable, which means uh, your R projects are easily transferable between machines. This is a feature which I found extremely helpful when I moved my project to from local machine to a cloud solution. Okay, what's more, Renf makes your R project also reproducible uh, since it tracks all the packages and their versions. Okay, a uh, few more words about Renf. Firstly, Renf supports uh, different so sources, not only CRAN or Bioconductor, but also GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. Uh, on top of that, you can also specify the version of, from a package on GitHub repository. What's more, Renf supports authentication. To give an example, let's say there is a package on GitHub and you'd like and this GitHub repository is private, Renf can do it for you. What's more, uh, there are shims. These are functions that mimic base R functions behavior like install packages, remove packages, update packages. But the difference is whenever package is already cached, Renf will skip the job for this package. On top of that, Renf also supports library management, log file management, package caching, and even Python use. Okay, when it comes to uh, using Renf, it is really straightforward. You call in it when it, whenever you want to initialize tracking. You call snapshot to, to save a state to a project library, to a log file. You call restore whenever you want to revert the changes. and if you want to take information about your current state, you just call it status. Okay. Uh, the second tool is Drake. Uh, I think you already know lots of tools for reproducibility. To name an example, let's say GNU Make, which automatically determines order for updating files. But the question is, why should you use Drake at all? While uh, most of the tools are language agnostic. Drake is a tool that has been especially designed for R projects. It reads all the code, and based on that, it creates a dependency graph. Uh, this is called static code analysis. And that is why you don't even have to take care of the order of your functions. OK, once the dependency graph is created, Renf oversees which steps are already done and skip those that are up to date okay as, as i said there is a dependency graph which can increase your uh, parallelization since drake allows distributed computing okay let's now take a look at the simple example from drake when you look at the graph th this graph is coming from a from my project which is master thesis about a feature feed link and all these names stand for feature filters. In our usual approach, we would have like few scripts. First, we would probably read the data frame and prepare the paths. Second, we would prepare the data files. Third, we would compute the results. And the last one would aggregate them. But in R, it is much easier with Drake, as you can see. You get a directed acyclic graph. Uh, OK. And when it comes to implementation, uh, it is really straightforward once more. Uh, because all you have to do is to list all the functions you want to call and put it into the Drake plan. And once you call, once you do it, you just call function make. And if everything went just fine, you get this greenish dependency graph. OK, and let's now say we would like to change something. In our usual approach, it would have meant that we, oh, let's say uh, there are two methods, quipped and chi, which stands for chi squared test. They are, these are both statistical tests. And let's now say we'd like to test other p-value thresholds. 
in our usual approach, it would have meant uh, that we have to recompute, reproduce all the steps that contain results in its name, but not with Drake. With Drake, it's much easier. As, as you can see over here, uh, on, we, we have to reproduce only outdated files because all the green dots stand for up-to-date files, up-to-date results, and these black dots are outdated. And as you can see, uh, Drake with this feature uh, saves us a lot of tremendous amount of time. Uh, and as you know, time is money. Uh, what's more, it ensures our project can be fully reproducible. Okay, to sum up, uh, both Renth and Drake uh, incorporated and used well to your our project can I can say ensure that your project is fully reproducible and what's even funnier they can be both incorporated at a very low cost because both of them are very easy both to learn and to use okay uh, when it comes to learning uh, these two tools both are very well documented uh, and there is there's, there's plenty of materials about Drake and there is even a repository learn, learn Drake which is simply a tutorial uh, which guides you through the Drake packages the creator is Will Landau which is also a creator of Drake package itself okay that's it uh, thank you for listening uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, feel free to ask questions, to, to things from my side. I would like to say uh, that I'm uh, very grateful uh, from Igor Burdukevich for his support. And I'd also, I'd, I would also uh, would like to point out that I'm uh, very proud. It's an honor to be a part of the team that you can see on the picture. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Jakub. That was really inspiring. Uh, because you have some more time, you were very fast. Maybe I will ask the question from a chat. How does Renf handle external dependencies like Java version or needed Linux uh, libraries? Oh, that's a tough question. I would, I would have to check this and I will answer right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, can you give me, can we, I, will, I, will, I will answer uh, after. The All right, that, okay. that's fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. I would like to be sure what I'm talking about. Okay. Makes sense. For now, I don't see any others. So maybe let's move to our final speaker, Martin Dubel. Uh, last but not least, Martin Dubel from Upsilon uh, will present a talk about using Grant and Docker for development environments. So let's see how it's done in Upsilon data science. I'm really looking forward to the talk and good luck, Martin. Thank you. Uh, let me find the presentation and share it. Okay, I hope that you can see my screen. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining um, us for this session about the development environments. So how to make your work easy to, to collaborate and to share it, uh, both among team members in your data science team uh, with future you, um, if you're working alone on some project, or with your clients or, or customers or anyone that you want to share your uh, project with. Uh, I will focus on two tools uh, here. So the RNF and, and Docker, and also how to combine them. And uh, I think I will be able to uh, answer the question for, for Jakub. Um, so my name is Martin Dubel. I work in, in Absilon as a data scientist and, and software engineer. And my main task is to build a shiny application that are uh, production ready and to, to help our clients in projects to, to optimize their uh, our, our structure and to make everything working smoothly. So from, from my experience uh, in the in, in over five years of delivering uh, data science and R uh, projects. Uh, what I found out is that uh, there are two types of challenges uh, ahead of data science teams. Uh, one is to create value and one is to share value. And this is a little bit connected to what 
Faris was talking about in the in the ed educational panel, so that they are uh, subject matter experts that are great in, in delivering value. So it can be some models or, or analysis, uh, but then there are problems with uh, coding it into the reproducible stable solution. Uh, sometimes to build a nice, uh, performant, shiny application that um, the other users can can interact with, and this is usually what we in Epsilon help with. So how to share this value mm, using the the tools that I will present? It's um, really helping. I uh, see the three cornerstones of how to achieve such production ready solutions and and how to deliver projects. Uh, the first one is uh, keeping the version control, the code clean, and this was nicely covered by the uh, Veronica's talk uh, today. I also do recommend uh, GitHub and uh, using uh, GitHub projects to set up uh, all of your tasks there. Uh, also, she mentioned that tests are crucial. Uh, I cannot agree more. And there is a very nice recent feature of GitHub uh, the, the GitHub Actions um, that, are, that are really nice uh, for setting the continuous integration. There is also a part about the data workflow. Uh, uh, I love the Drake that Jakub was talking about. It is really helping uh, in, in the projects that we are delivering in, in Epsilon. Uh, I also do recommend your data validator package uh, by the Epsilon that helps to make sure that your data is, is correct. Um, and I would uh, mention also Plumber package to organize your data workflow in a nice API. And finally, there is this, this part for, for making your project like production ready and ready to be shared and, and, and delivered to your client. And this is environment. And this is what I would like to focus uh, on during that talk. So let's proceed. Uh, if you are... Uh, working for uh, quite some time uh, in, in IT, in, in, in programming and everything related to building applications, you probably have heard that uh, it works for me, but it is not working on your colleague's machine. And this is a usual case, and this is really painful. And I'm really glad that uh, in all of uh, three talks here and on uh, many conferences, we are discussing this issue but it appears like all the time. So this is still a problem um, in the community. Uh, lack of development environment is a cause of that trouble. And this is, this is an anti-pattern that will cause you a lot of mess. So it may uh, happen uh, to produce a code errors because the same code will, will behave differently on different machines because the, the, the versions of the packages or R that you're using uh, it's different. And those kinds of bugs are, are really hard to debug uh, because if someone is like uh, mentioning to you that, that such such bug, such error occurs, you cannot reproduce it correctly. Uh, so this is super time consuming. Uh, so you, you should avoid it. Uh, um, the deployments will be really hard. Uh, if you if you want to deploy your application or your project, your analysis to some server, you won't know what versions of, of the packages you've been using. And uh, uh, years ago, uh, in my in my first company, our team tried to like keep the script of all the versions used, and this is just not working. You need to have some tool that will take care of it. Uh, if you are not using uh, any package management in R. Uh, it can be really harmful for your other projects uh, if that if you modify package version if you update it in your one project uh, it can make your other other projects stop working because they are all shared and finally the collaboration with your with your colleagues with your teammates uh, will be really painful because they cannot just jump in and work on your code they need to focus on setting environment so uh, those are the problems that we, uh, as Epsilon, found uh, when working on with, with our clients. Uh, what I found during uh, my personal career, working in different teams, and those are quite easy to be overcome. But you 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 just need to 
to use those tools. They're, they are very easy to, to implement. Um, so why not to do it? So they are basically uh, two pillars of making a reproducible development workflow. Um, so one is the our project dependency management. So having all of uh, all of the versions of the projects and dependencies that you're using. And this is basically covered by an RNF package that uh, all three of us here are mentioning. So I, I'm really glad that um, that this is becoming popular. I cannot imagine working now in our projects without um, setting up RNF uh, as, a, as a first step. And the, uh, the second part is to have the isolated cont container for all other dependencies. So for example, those system dependencies uh, that someone asked uh, Jakub about, uh, they can be kept in the in the Docker image uh, along with the RNF. And I will also tell you a little bit about how we combine those uh, those two technologies to work together uh, to, to make our, our projects super easy to, uh, to be used. So RNF, uh, just quickly overview, uh, you, we've already heard a lot of it. Uh, it's package management. It creates an independent environment for your project. Uh, so I would like to highlight it that it won't affect the other projects of your uh, on your local computer. Uh, so this is this is a must uh, for me right now to be sure that everything works works fine. Uh, and this is super easy to share. It was also mentioned by uh, my co-speakers that. Uh, all the state um, of, of your project is saved into the single file and it can be shared with the team. It can be just commit and pushed to the repository and, and, and used by, by others. And one thing that I would like to highlight, uh, it, it was not mentioned and it might be confusing for you, that there is a Packrat package that is doing more or less the same. And it even has an in our studio an, an icon uh, but I, I I do recommend you to not use the Packrat. Uh, RNF is much simpler and and better and and more intuitive, and it's just working uh, well. And Packrat is uh, is not behaving correctly, and right now uh, it is not supported anymore, and all the development is done in in RNF. So I'm expecting that this icon will be removed soon. So don't be tempted to, to use Packrat, just, just forget and uh, follow, the, uh, follow the workflow uh, that I will present here that is, that is super easy and, and just use, use RNF. So step zero, uh, even if you are not using RNF or, or, or doing anything, just use our projects for, for anything that you're doing in R to keep it clean and to keep it separated. Once you have our project, uh, Install the RNF package, of course, uh, just with install packages, uh, the, the newest version will be the best, uh, and initialize it, and it will add this uh, RNF log file that you can later share, commit, uh, and push to, to your repository uh, in GitHub, for example. Um, then install packages, as you would normally do. Uh, you can do it with, with RNF or, or with regular install packages, and uh, save the snapshot of, of, of the versions that you're using on the RNF log file. And, uh, then commit, push, and then what is all, only thing needed by your colleague, by your teammate, is to restore the environment using the RNF log file, and, and it will be restored. And as uh, I think Jakub mentioned that, uh, that it will uh, also use cached packages from global environment speeds thing up. Uh, this restore uh, part is also crucial for uh, making it work with Docker. I will tell you about it in a minute. So here we have uh, the Docker part. Uh, Docker is a, is a tool for, for building uh, containers that are also doing the separate environments, but on like more high, high, higher level. So uh, it is encapsulating all of the software needed including uh, our version or, or even our studio. Mm. In, my, in my team in Epsilon, they are, they are even my colleagues that they're not having our studio installed locally on the computer uh, to not be 
tempted to use it. Uh, they are just uh, using a container image for the projects with the RStudio in browser so that they can then easily share it uh, with other team members. Um, and they will make sure that not only the packages are the same, but also the R version, the R Studio, uh, and every other system dependencies uh, that you would install on, on your server. Uh, also, what is uh, super cool about Docker, uh, that you can share your images with your team um, once you build them, and also that you can use uh, ready solutions from, from the Docker Hub uh, that will probably contain uh, everything that you need. I recommend you to check out the, the rocker, which is the images for working with, with R. And what we also uh, love uh, to, to, to work with, uh, with Docker is that usually we have uh, one Docker file uh, that we used in basically most of our projects and we share them using GitHub templates, another feature of, of GitHub that I uh, recommend you. Um, so it makes it super easy to start a new project, to launch a new project. Uh, in uh, our uh, consulting work uh, as an Epsilon, uh, there are often cases when the projects are, are very, uh, very short, like one week or two weeks, and we cannot waste time on, on, on building Docker files, setting up the environment and so on. So we just are sharing this template to just focus on the code and delivering the value to our clients. Uh, I, I really love it. And this is also possible because of we combined the, the, the Docker and RN uh, approaches. So what you usually have in your, in your Docker file, if you are using that to reproduce your um, R environment is some script, uh, that is run in the Docker file that is probably installing some versions of your packages. Uh, if it is done with uh, specifying the version, it is it is good, it is correct, and not by just install packages. But the point is that that in the Docker file it is uh, installing uh, our packages in the in the R uh, in your container, mm, and this is okay. This is working fine. The problem is that for each change of the of the version or each additional package, uh, the the developer needs to modify the Docker file and rebuild the image, and make sure that that, that they remember about about updating the the values there. And it's not always the case. It's quite painful and it's additional manual manual work. So what we are currently using, um, it's just restoring the environment, but inside Docker container. So all the uh, familiar function uh, for you, if you are using uh, RNF already, so to restore um, in the Docker file, uh, based on the, uh, on the RNF log file, uh, taken from the, uh, from the repository, from the Git repository, saved along with the code. So this is uh, really nice for us when we are working um, because it only requires us to save uh, the packages once. Uh, and additional gain is that uh, it saves it with all of the dependencies saved in the RNF log, which it cannot be done uh, quite nicely if we just explicitly use it there. So this is super small step, but it is changing a lot for us and simplifying things. And so we are using this fixed dev environment uh, using Docker's and uh, RN flock files. They are dedicated to the project. We share the changes on the GitHub and the images on the Docker Hub. They are also versions to have it private, both on Docker Hub and GitHub. And they might cost something. I'm not uh, familiar with the prices. Uh, but it's only needed if there is something specific for a client that you need to keep secret community. Um, and this is our simple workflow. Um, and then we can focus on, on building code and delivering the value um, for the clients in, in our projects and to not be overloaded with setting the environment. So uh, three takeaways, uh, just to sum up, uh, always use our project and use it with a separate package management. It should be 
uh, your bread and butter to when you start our project to install RNF and, and use it there. Uh, it, it's a no brainer and it saves you a lot of troubles. Uh, use Docker containers to, to develop and to deploy the applications. Uh, it will save you a lot of time. And having that, um, uh, uh, having that workflow that you already are developing in the, uh, in the Docker container, uh, it will save you a lot of trouble when you are deploying because you're using the exact same versions and system dependencies. And uh, if you combine those, those two tools, uh, it will make you super simple to, to manage your projects. Uh, and you can set it just just once for all of your projects because the the restore part will will not change so you don't uh, need to worry that there are some other packages installed in your particular project because it is just restoring uh, the rnf log file and nothing more uh, just one more slide uh, uh, that uh, i i need to show you because we are very interested in in uh, having more uh, our Shiny developers on board. Uh, we are delivering a lot of excellent Shiny dashboards and we would love to work with, with more talented people. Uh, we are not restricted to, to RN Shiny. We delivered uh, package, uh, applications in different technologies, uh, also some machine learning. Uh, so please, if you are interested, uh, check out our careers um, site. And that's all from me. Uh, I would be love to discuss with you. I will check the, the Slack channel if there is anything there. I recommend to you to contact me on Twitter or uh, via mail. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Martin, for your talk. That was a lot of great content and, and knowledge. I think there's a follow up on Slack. And uh, let's call it a wrap. And let's move to the keynote for now. Thank you, Martin, and thank you,